Uh, last time we was uh, we were stopped in the middle of this problem, so I briefly summarize uh, the problem uh, definition statement again. Uh, it was about uh, solving uh, this uh, one-dimensional transient heat conduction problem through a slab with the width or length uh, L and the uh, Heat flux is provided at the left end here, and the right end is insulated. And our goal is to calculate or estimate the temperature at the left end, at the end of the cycle, transient cycle, which is a thousand seconds here. And what we hope is that the probability uh, that the temperature exists 900 degrees C should be less than uh, 1%. And if the model is accurate enough and a, a confidence enough, then we get a confidence on this uh, result uh, probability. And uh, there are uh, three uh, kinds of uh, experimental data for this problem, uh, material level and the component level and the accreditation level. So I explained the things about the, uh, the data here. It was, uh, at first, I uh, also explained there are three kinds of data uh, in order to let the participants uh, investigate the influence of the size of the data in their results. So low size, medium size, and high size were respectively provided for each of the uh, level of the experiments. What I mean uh, is uh, material level, component level, and accreditation level. And the material level uh, experimental data was this. There were two material uh, properties. One, uh, heat conductivity. The other, rho CP, uh, specific heat. In case of a uh, component level, uh, they call it uh, as an ensemble. In case of this experiment, there were four uh, configurations. They uh, experimented with the two different uh, lengths, the widths of the slab. And also, they provided two different uh, heat fluxes for uh, this uh, problem. And made uh, four uh, experiments and four results uh, of data. And this uh, shows uh, the, the data. And uh, you can uh, look at one of the results because they are uh, repeated four times at one configuration. They have uh, four uh, data, experiment one, two, three, four, at a configuration. And uh, what we see here is the temperature values from the beginning to the end of the cycle with the interval uh, 100 seconds. And these are the temperature values. And uh, in case of the accreditation experiment, uh, we ha had an experiment only one configuration here. And uh, uh, when we uh, say the accreditation, uh, originally it has meaning that uh, it is a little closer to, the, to our target application. So this is accreditation experiments with the same uh, length of the slab, but a closer to, uh, the heat flux is closer to the uh, target uh, problem. For this problem, they experimented in more detail. So more detailed data are provided uh, in case of this uh, experiment. And uh, this is the result. Uh, compared to this uh, component level, they measure the temperature with uh, the, the smaller interval. From the beginning to the end, they measure the temperature with the uh, interval of uh, 50 seconds. And uh, in this case, they didn't repeat experiment. They, uh, uh, they, they repeated only twice, not four times. So they had uh, two uh, replications for this ex experiment. And what uh, we see here also is not only the, uh, the temperature at the left end, uh, in this case, they also provide the, the temperature at the middle of the slab and the right end. 
So this is the uh, data for the accreditation experiment. Based on these experimental data, what we need is to, uh, yes. Um, in case of accreditation experiments, the configuration is different from the component levels. Yeah. You can see the length uh, information uh, for the uh, component level and the accreditation level here. So uh, we remember that uh, our goal is to calculate temperature at the left end. Calculate temperature at the left end and at the end of the cycle. Which is time at 1,000 seconds. And this will not be given in a single value because we have uh, several uncertainties and we calibrate uh, some unknown parameters uh, based on the experimental data. So the, what we will get for this temperature will be uh, not just a single value, but in the form of a distribution. And uh, <coughs> for this problem, there are several approaches by uh, several different participants at the time. And I choose only one out of them, them uh, which was made by these authors. And they employed uh, what they call the Bayesian calibration approach. And you can find the uh, uh, full detail uh, of the approach in that paper. And originally, it was based on the, uh, this paper by these authors. These authors are uh, fully uh, mathematicians fully statisticians. And uh, they wrote a paper based on calibration of computer models at that time. And if anybody is serious about uh, this stuff, verification validation, then they will find in many places this paper is cited. This paper is very a uh, famous paper, uh, what they call a, a seminal paper. And uh, many people are following this approach in uh, their application of uh, uh, calibration validation. So <clears throat> these authors also employ this approach. And uh, they assume the material properties, conductivity, uh, specific heat, these two are assumed as unknowns to be calibrated conditional on the experimental data. And the abbreviation, you remember, ensemble experiments, which stands for component level experiments, accreditation experiments. So these two parameters will be uh, estimated such that they match the experimental data. What happened to the material level data? MC stands for material characterization. Uh, the measurements of the conductivity, measurements of the specific heat, there were also this data. And for this data, they were used only for making priors of the two uh, parameters. There were also the model discrepancy. I will talk about this later. But uh, as of now, I will uh, explain very briefly about their concept. The model discrepancy can happen uh, in many cases. Suppose uh, we don't know the true model. And the true model behaves like uh, the drag coefficient is proportional to the quadratic velocity. But we don't know that. So we just assume that the drag will be proportional to the velocity itself, linearly. 
And this is our first assumption, but we don't know the truth. So we employ this model and make computation. And what happens? The truth is here, but we go through this process using this model. No matter how, uh, how many efforts we make uh, to make the computation accurate, we end up with the, some kinds of a fundamental difference between the reality and our prediction. In that case, we uh, face some kinds of a model discrepancy. And uh, that paper also takes care of that discrepancy automatically within their process. And I'll uh, talk about this later. So uh, uh, forget uh, uh, until, that, uh, until when I uh, introduce that stuff. So uh, <clears throat> the basic methods they have employed uh, during this process was pretty much the same process that I taught you in the first part the Bayesian statistics. Some of the students had a kind of a complaints that uh, why we are learning this? We just uh, involved with the uh, statistics. And uh, this is why we learned about that part. We will apply that technique into this problem. The same thing. We have the unknown parameters. We have the observed data. And the conditional on this observation, we'd like to estimate the degree of belief of this in the form of a posterior distribution. And uh, based on the famous base rule, it is given by the multiplication of this and this. And the first was a prior, and the second was a likelihood. Likelihood to get the, this, this experimental data based on these given uh, values. So all the process is the same as the one that I taught you, even with this complex application. The prior, if you don't have any knowledge or information, you just put it non-informative. In this case, we have the prior knowledge of the material uh, measurement data. That will be used as a prior here. So what? do we get from out of this uh, process? We get the uh, samples. We will use the Markov chain Monte Carlo. And actually, it was used also in this paper to estimate these two parameters. So uh, in that case, we have a large number of samples, like uh, 10,000, 100,000 number of samples for these two parameters. And using each of the individual values of these two parameters, we can make calculations. Uh, we can uh, solve the heat conduction problem. And uh, uh, finally, we will get the temperature at the end, and the left end, and at the end of the cycle. So we will also have the same number of uh, temperature samples. If we have 10,000 samples of here, we will get the 10,000 samples of temperature. And that represents the distribution of our uh, ultimate uh, solution. Yes. Yes, this is it. Yes. <laughs> so in terms of the material level data, uh, what they did was to fit those data into a certain probability distribution. In this case, they uh, found it is uh, the normal distribution will be good to represent the, da the data. And uh, there are uh, many uh, standard techniques to find out the, uh, the two model parameters uh, from the data. And uh, what they got was this and this for conductivity and the heat uh, uh, specific heat. And this exact expression was uh, put into the prior. 
Then after going through the Markov chain Monte Carlo, we will get a uh, uh, large number of samples. And uh, most of the case, you already familiar. In that case, uh, what we uh, uh, use is to drawing some kind of a figure like this, it's a contour plot, or three-dimensional histogram. Uh, I trained you uh, to be familiar with that. So you have to uh, uh, already be familiar with this. Uh, for the two parameters, the conductivity and the specific heat, we have the uh, plus like this for the low size data, medium and high size. As we go through the, from the low size to the high size, we see the probability distribution is narrowed down. And we have a, we gain more confidence on this part. The value will be located at, uh, somewhere uh, around this part as a result of the calibration. And we can also check whether we get the correct estimated results or not. Uh, that can be made using this uh, comparison. We can <coughs> do the simulation using the calibrated model. Actually, this is the calibrated parameters. Using the calibrated parameters, we can make calculations. We can solve the problems what they did uh, for their experiments. The component levels, four configurations, accreditation level, you remember that? And uh, for those uh, five or four configurations, we can also make calculations and uh, compare with the experimental data. They should uh, almost perfectly agree each other. Otherwise, something is wrong. So it's kind of a, a validation. Is this done? Oh, in this case, uh, it was uh, something like a median or the mean out of the, the uh, distributed results. And I didn't say uh, much about this discrepancy. And uh, even in this case, they found some uh, difference between the model and the experiment. And they identified uh, this discrepancy uh, based on the... Uh, their uh, Bayesian calibration process. And uh, I, I don't talk this uh, uh, now about this detail about, uh, at this time. <clears throat> now we move to the, our real goal, our ultimate goal, which was to predict the temperature at the left end, at the end of cycle, at untried condition. What I mean at untried condition is I introduced you a figure like this. There was a four uh, configurations for the component level. There was a accreditation level. And this is the real our target condition. And we don't have any experimental data for here. For all the other parts, we have uh, experimental data. And, uh, Parameters were calibrated based on this data. And we will use this to predict this. This is it. So to, for target problem, we make a posterior prediction using each of the estimated parameters out of uh, uh, many samples. We can calculate the temperature individually, so we can uh, make the samples of temperatures, and that's a dis distribution. And the result is the here. So for low size data, medium, high, uh, what we got was the, uh, for the 90% confidence interval, the lower bound, upper bound was given like this from the samples of temperatures. And we calculate the probability that the temperature will exceed 900 degrees C. And the result was this. And originally, what they required was if that probability is greater than 1%, uh, it is failure. 
we have to consider redesign of that heat conduction problem. So this is all about. Uh, although this is kind of a simple uh, introductory example, this process can be applied the same to the other uh, problems on your own. Interestingly, the organizers did not provide the exact answer for this. So participants just uh, showed their results. And in my opinion, it will, whatever kind of, a, whatever size of data use, my conclusion is always it exceeds the probability of this. And they did not provide the exact answer. This is another challenge problem. So uh, if I can afford uh, this with my students, I will also prepare and participate uh, this uh, uh, problem. And about the, there are uh, liquid within here, and there are high pressure within here, and uh, it undergoes uh, uh, high tensile load. So we, the failure is uh, important in the design of uh, this uh, tank. And uh, they provide uh, some kind of uh, experimental data for this tank. And they let the participant to calibrate the unknown parameters uh, based on their data and validate and uh, predict. So all the process is the same with only the different application. I would not uh, go through this here. If time is allowed, I will, I will uh, explain about this later. What, this was about the uh, uh, spot welding calibration problem and the car crash. And uh, I will skip this now. And move to the Overcomes textbook. In the textbook, chapter 12, there is a figure like this. And the authors introduced uh, what, uh, is the uh, what is the validation of the model and experiments. And this figure was that. The most primitive way, very easy. You can uh, even just take it, uh, looking at this figure, you what it means. The, the easiest and the most primitive way is to just look at the results side by side of the model, experiments, and if they look good, yes, it is validated. And but this is uh, too much uh, subjective and too much uh, uh, qualitative. And the next one is to uh, compare the deterministic solution which is given by this curve uh, against the experimental data uh, carried out only once at uh, each uh, point of the input uh, variables. Still, this is uh, qualitative, subjective. Just look at uh, the two, compare the two, and uh, uh, decide whether uh, they are in agreement or not. The third one, uh, includes now the uh, measurement error, uncertainty associated with the experiment. So uh, we begin to uh, look at the, the uncertainty bar in the result of the experimental data. And also still the compare uh, through the figure, whether they agree or not. And the fourth, in this case, we are introducing the error in the model. But in this case, it only includes the numerical error. And it is the stuff addressed by the verification. Like a, a small number of mesh, larger number of mesh, and convergence conditions, things like that. And that is introduced into the computational error here uh, in the uh, deterministic uh, results. And the fifth one, we begin to introduce the uncertainty of the input parameters. 
uh, up to now, what we assumed that uh, assumed here was the, the input variable represented by uh, normally x x. We assume that this is deterministic. When we say x is 2.8, we regard it as truly 2.8. But in reality, it cannot be uh, like that. It could be uh, distributed due to some kind of uncertainty. So even the input parameters is uh, uh, treated as the uh, distributed parameters. So we have a confidence or uncertainty bounds horizontally. And reflecting, reflecting those uncertainty into the model output, we get uh, this uh, uh, range of the uncertainty bar for the uh, deterministic output, uh, model output. Also, the experiments, the same thing. And the last figure is uh, the same thing as this one, but it is given in the form of a contour plot. And all these figures are just a, a brief introduction of what it is in terms of a, a validation uh, in the figure. And uh, based on this, the textbook introduces uh, the importance of uh, some kind of a validation metric. And he defined this as the mathematical operator that measures the difference between SRQ uh, from simulation and experiment. And the thing that the textbook emphasizes is that we have to have some kind of a quantitative measure, not just a subjective, not just a comparison by si uh, side by side. So that's why he is introducing this uh, operator. And uh, when we see this definition, we uh, see uh, SRQ here. And S SRQ represents the system response quantity. And uh, this is uh, just a uh, whatever result we get. In case of a thermal problem, it was a temperature at the left end at the end of the cycle. When we will deal with the, the uh, rotating helicopter, there will be some kind of a this. Uh, in any problem, you have to consider introducing some kind of a, uh, the thing that we uh, will measure, we will get from the model. So this represents that. And in terms of the uh, ways of getting this, there are, uh, th uh, the SRQ can be classified in this way. It could be uh, some kind of a derivatives. It could also be the integrals or more complex uh, things. And also, it could be a, a simple scalar or vector quantities. And uh, normally, we know that the integral is uh, preferred than the derivative in terms of accuracy. Uh, the, uh, the error is amplified when we make derivative. So this is the recommendation. If one can uh, define the integral and derivative at the si same time, and integral is more recommended. Scalar is better than vector, the, uh, the same thing. So in today's class, we assume the model is deterministic. In the next class, we will go to the non-deterministic model. But today, we will stay at the deterministic model. Experimental data, in this case, we consider the measurement error for this and this, whatever it is. Always experimental data includes the error and uncertainty. And in the today's class, more specifically, we will introduce the variable metric uh, in terms of this. So means uh, based on this and this. I will explain this uh, later. And in the case of a non-deterministic model, I'd like to uh, 
talk about this uh, also because uh, we have uh, two kinds of uncertainty. Uh, one is the aleatory, the other is the epistemic. So we will study uh, about the vari uh, validation metric in case of two uncertainties. And uh, they are different a little bit, each other. So first, too much primitive, too easy. Uh, when we have only the deterministic model, uh, we get a single output. We get a single result. And uh, we have uh, experimental data that has uncertainty. In that case, uh, the easiest way is to introduce this metric. Uh, this metric includes the confidence interval of the unknown mean of the difference. The difference is defined by this E tilde, uh, which is the model output uh, minus uh, mean of the experimental output. And this is the uh, lower uh, bound, and this is the upper bound. And the, the formula here is uh, very easy. You can find uh, the background materials in uh, whatever the other notes. Example, at each of the case, uh, the textbook it introduces uh, applied examples. So this is the one. Uh, when it comes to the comparing the means, they have this experimental data for this problem. And I'm not interested in uh, explaining the detail of this uh, problem. We are not uh, interested in this. And we just uh, focus on the results. Uh, the exper from the experimental data, their confidence upper and lower bound are given here, 90%. And uh, they have a computer model that computes this result. And uh, the computer model output is given here. So because the computer model output is here and the experimental data confidence bounds are here, they regard this as the, the model is accurate enough. The model is validated because it is within the uncertainty uh, bounds of the experimental data. Or also, at the same time, use the uh, metric uh, introduced in the textbook, the difference E tilde. The E tilde's confidence bounds are given here, and the zero is here. So uh, this can be used as well, instead of this one, whatever it is. And I'd like to remind you one more time, what if? In this case, fortunately, it was validated. It was accurate. The model was accurate. But in case the model is uh, different enough, then we have to uh, move to the, uh, this uh, feedback process. One is the uh, reducing experimental uncertainty or the other is the calibration of the some parameters. Some parameters may be wrong, so we calibrate based on the experimental data. This is just to remind you about that. Next case is that uh, uh, the case we have uh, output over the range of input values. Previously, it was a very simple. The output was a just one, a scalar value. In this case, we get the output over the range of x from the computer model and also from the experimental data. In this case, the validation metric is just extended to the range of x. And this is the difference. And these are the confidence upper and lower bounds. But because this is not just a single value, the textbook prefers introducing a single ultimate value. So in this case, what can we do is uh, introducing 
the average of this over this range or maximum over that range. Uh, whatever it takes, uh, you can uh, choose at your convenience. And then the result will be uh, like this. And if this is uh, between, uh, if, if the zero value is between this interval, then we say the model is valid. Yes. Yes. It should also depend on how much uh, spread is there, right? Uh, spread, uh, when you say spread is uh, the uh, upper and lower bound, this value, I guess. Right. Yes. So if, if the upper and lower bound are sufficiently far away from zero, then maybe the model is again not valid even if, the, even if zero lies in the interval. Uh, in terms of this uh, validation metric only, I cannot say uh, more than that. I just say if the zero is uh, between the uh, upper and lower uh, interval, I just say it is valid, only based on this metric. And there should be other way uh, considering that kind of uh, uh, situation. Another example for this case, I don't know what this means. Some kind of a turbulent buoyant pl plum uh, problem. And uh, SRQ is the, uh, because the response is not a single value, but varies from uh, here to here along the actual distance. So uh, in this case, the textbook introduces the average uh, velocity. Uh, based on this. And uh, this is the experimental data they measured uh, for replications. And they uh, got this. And uh, they have a computational model that can predict the same thing. And the computational model is given by a single line. And uh, experimental data, uh, this full set of uh, data. And among uh, using uh, those information, what they got was this uh, global metric uh, based on the, uh, their formula given uh, by the previous slide. In this case, they didn't use the maximum. They uh, introduced the average of the velocity over that range, over this range. So uh, what can we say from here? The average relative error is more than 2%. So it uh, is above the zero level. So um, I'm sorry. It could not be a correct explanation. Um, let me go over this uh, in the textbook, and uh, I'll get back to you later. The third case that the textbook introduces is the, uh, the case when only a few data are available. And I was a little confused with the case here and uh, just a moment ago. In that case, it was uh, also the same experimental data. But in that case, the data were made over a range, many data could be measured with a very small interval. But the case that I will introduce now is the, the data cannot be made in this way. The data can be collected only a few uh, number of uh, uh, input variables. And in this case, we uh, go through the regression process because only a few data are available. This is the case. And because we also uh, already familiar with the regression, 
And the uncertainty analysis of the regression, we already uh, learned about that. So we just introduced the uh, final result here. And uh, what we see here is the, the regression, the variance of the regression uh, made uh, by this formula. Also, there was an example explaining this. And uh, uh, the, the most important thing uh, for all of this process is the, we have a deterministic computer model. We have experimental data with the uncertainty. And uh, they uh, make comparison using uh, this uh, validation metric. And if this is within this uh, confidence interval, uh, that is regarded as validated. Another one the textbook deals with is the case of a nonlinear regression. Compared to the linear regression, the nonlinear regression uh, introduces the nonlinear equations, nonlinear expressions, uh, and uh, the associated coefficients or parameters. And here it is uh, defined as a theta. And in this case, the regression model, the coefficients or parameters of theta should be found uh, to fit uh, to the experimental data uh, using this uh, optimization uh, problem. Or we can also use the uh, Bayesian technique to estimate this theta uh, in the form of a distribution. So uh, both methods can be used to estimate the unknown uh, regression parameters. And uh, I prefer, obviously, the latter method, because it can uh, provide the uncertainty of the data, experimental data, upper bound and lower bound. And uh, using this result, we can compare uh, with the computational model. And uh, the example here was about uh, uh, this uh, problem. And uh, this was the experimental data for this problem. And they wanted to uh, fit this experimental data using this uh, nonlinear equation. And the theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, these three parameters are the parameters to be estimated based on the experimental data. And this was the three-dimensional contour plot. Uh, like uh, within this uh, volume, there may be a uh, true unknown parameters with a maximum likelihood that uh, fits uh, the, uh, that the computer model, the, the, that this regression model fits this data. And this is the upper and lower bound of based on this regression and the computer model. And they made comparison using the, uh, the same uh, validation metric. So uh, this is the all I have for today. The uncertainty is some error bars on that data. When you have fewer data and you fit the, the regression, the uncertainty in the regression can be smaller than the uncertainty in the data because uh, for example, if you fit a linear line to four data points, uh, the uncertainty will be smaller than the noise in the individual ones. So we get the interesting result that 
that with the regression, with few data, we get a smaller uncertainty than when we have a lot of data. Which to me means that even when we have a lot of data, it may be better to do regression. I, uh, yeah, to some extent, I have the same opinion with you. Uh, first one, I didn't pay attention uh, before about this. Uh, this was uh, addressed by the textbook, so that's why I am explaining this. But personally, I don't want to uh, go into the detail of this case. I just uh, want to always, whatever uh, data, how many data it is, I just use the regression, not uh, rely on this. So, uh, it, 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 this is not a good uh, example. This is not a good case to explain uh, when we talk about the validation. Uh, I would personally, I'd like to recommend and forget this one and uh, use always the regression of experimental data. Can I say a few words about the homework that will assign the helicopter homework? Yes. So this afternoon, uh, we are going to assign a validation homework using the paper helicopter. And uh, had to grapple with two issues. And you can provide feedback after you see the homework. One, feed, one issue was that doing the experiments is fairly time consuming, that is we have quite a bit of a experience with that. And therefore, <clears throat> we ended up uh, having three options that you can use. Uh, the minimal one, for which you can still get 100% credit for the homework, is using data that others will provide. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the second option would be to use this data and um, also use your own data, uh, for which you can get up to 120% credit. And the last option is to generate the data within the first week that is up to Tuesday of next week, I guess next Monday, there is no, um, no classes. Uh, and that data will be used to provide other people with data. That is, we will look at um, the data and select maybe five sets of data that we consider the high quality and <clears throat> that would be provided. So that was one issue. Uh, the second is that this is a, a mini project that is its homework that is worth, that will take probably more time than the previous homework. And there is, of course, the standard way of accounting for that by having it have a higher weight than other homework. Um, instead, we made it a homework that you can get extra credit. So if you take advantage of all the, the credits you will see, you can get up to 200% on that homework. And you may want to do your own calculations, but I think that you'll find that it's more advanta advantageous than if we simply made it equal to two or three other homework. 
So these are things that uh, we'll post it this afternoon and take a look at it and provide feedback if you want to.